OK, I think uh, it's kind of safe to get going. So today we're going to talk about getting back to the basics, understanding uh, the analytical laboratory, uh, chromatography, and I'm going to give you a bunch of lab hacks because there isn't a scientist around who doesn't like a good lab hack. Just uh, let's just do a little quick sound check. If uh, if everything is OK, you can put OK in the in the chat box just so I know that everybody is is hearing me. If one or two people could just put OK uh, in the chat box, then I know we're good to go. Thank you, everyone. All right, so let's get going. So this is a general workflow for an analytical laboratory. You have your sample selection and your sample preparation. Then you go to pre preparing your lab or your, your equipment or your instrumentation. And then you get into the, the nuts and bolts of your analytical testing. I'm going to go through a few lab hacks for all of them and give you some ideas and some background information about it all. First, it comes down to sample collection. Now, sample collection has a lot of different steps to it, and usually by the time it gets to the laboratory, it's in those orange steps, the laboratory samples. But it starts with some sort of lot or batch. There is a particular field that is being sampled, a particular batch is being sampled, and those then are gathered and primary samples are taken from that lot or batch. That means not every single part of that lot or batch is being sampled, so they're going to pull a few samples, and these are going to become the primary samples. But you can combine different lots, primary samples together to make yourself a bulk sample. So maybe you're going to do uh, 10 different uh, pieces in this one lot, 10 different pieces in this other lot, and you're going to combine them together and that's going to make a bulk sample. And then that bulk sample goes to testing for, for testing in the laboratory. When it gets to the laboratory, it can be taken uh, for different processes. And usually it's at this point there is some sort of homogenization done or some type of of commingling of samples before they get to the later processes. This might be um, bulk crushing of samples. It might be fine processing of samples. And then once that is done, it goes to the different departments. Maybe a, a part goes for micro, a part goes for heavy metals, a part goes for pesticides. And then those analytical samples are treated even further by extraction or digestion or some other type of process. And then you've got your aliquot or your testing portion, and that becomes what you actually test. It's very important, though, when I go through some of these lab hacks and some of these ideas, I might say, oh, this is a great idea for, you know, doing this for your solvents. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as universal, and I will try hard if there's an exception to give you the exception to the rule. But think about these lab hacks and these suggestions and these ideas in your own process and how they fit with what you know you're doing in your laboratory. Now, here are some of those general truths about samples. Cold is better than hot, meaning keeping your sample cold nine times out of 10 is going to be better than keeping your sample at room temperature unless there's a specific reason for you keeping it at room temperature. Keeping your sample in a dark container or in a amber container often is better than keeping it in a container that can be exposed to light. Again, it's a general truth, but there are exceptions. It's always better to have more of a sample than less of a sample. You don't want to have to figure out how you divide one gram of sample amongst 12 different processes. You would like 10 grams or 100 grams, so more is better than less. The smaller the particle size, the, the better the extraction of the digestion compared to a large particle size. It's going to be easier to get something into solution or extract it if it's a smaller particle versus a larger particle. And a like is better than different, meaning that you want the most representative sample you can get from whatever samples you're getting, and you don't want them to be different. You don't want them to be heterogeneous. You want them to be homogeneous. And often that involves, you have to do some sample processing. And it involves grinding or milling or partitioning your sample out so you can do further extractions, digestions, uh, derivatizations, or whatever else you have to do with it. So. Homogeneity is very dependent on particle size. Here are some common sizes of particles. You have like a five millimeter maybe. You're um, doing a particular grain sample and it gives you chunks and they're giving you chunks that are between two and five millimeters. That's between a pencil eraser size and a crayon tip size. If you're looking at particles that are the size of a pencil point, it's about one millimeter particles. And if you're looking at a fine ballpoint pen, it's about half a millimeter. Now, why does this matter? 
let's say that you are testing something of, of high value or you don't have a lot of a particular sample and you need to be able to test it for a lot of different things, but it's uh, a five millimeter particle size and you're going to use it as a five millimeter. And you have in your SOPs, your, your standard operating procedures, that for your process, you're allowed a 10% uncertainty. Well, that means you need to test 125 grams of a five millimeter sample in order to meet that 10% uncertainty. But if you had a particle size that was 0.5 millimeters, you'd only need 0.13 grams. So you would need a lot less of a sample. So the finer the particle size, the less you need to use of it as well. So now let's talk about some laboratory testing and preparation. This is going to include things like how do you measure things? How do you use your volumetrics? How do you use standards when you use your standards? What are the solvents and materials and how are they best used? So let's talk about getting down to the nuts and bolts, weighing, mixing, and dispensing. Here are some general truths again. And some of them are gonna sound like, well, yeah, duh, but we've all done these kind of things. Do check the scales weight limit. Now, everybody's like, oh, of course, you're going to check the scale's weight limit. But I cannot tell you how many times in my professional laboratory life I've put in something down on a scale to go weigh it and realized I'm going to max out that scale before I'm doing finished doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's usually not the sample. I'm like, oh, well, I only need a gram of the sample. It's usually the vessel I put it in. So that goes to number two, pre-weigh your labware. If you're going to use that particular beaker, make sure that it's not going to tip the scale, so to speak, uh, on your on your weight, and you're not going to be able to weigh your sample because you're taking up all of that scale from the beaker that you're using. And if you have no other choice and you have to use this particular glassware, this particular scale, this particular um, tray or whatever, uh, think about splitting your samples beforehand. You don't want to get halfway through your measurement or your weighing and realize, whoops, you know, I have to stop it and go find another vessel for it. So plan ahead. I know it sounds kind of obvious, but we've all done it. Do not weigh liquids before solids. And there are, that's one of those caveats. Yes, there's going to be some times you're going to want weigh your liquids before your solids. But there's a lot of reasons if you can hold off doing it, it's best. First of all, a lot of liquids we use, a lot of solvents we use, evaporate quickly, and it's going to be very hard for that scale to stabilize if your acetone or your acetonitrile is evaporating as you're trying to measure it. Secondly, as we've all done, sometimes we weigh a little too much. It is impossible to get your solid out of the liquid once you put it into it. So again, obvious, but weigh your liquids before your solids. And another obvious one, but sometimes we don't think about it until it's too late. If you know a particular sample has a distinct odor, if you know it's a smelly acid, if you know it's like isoamyl alcohol or something else that has an incredibly pungent smell, um, you're going to want to do that inside a hood. And you might not even want to do it during regular business hours. Uh, in our specs laboratories, we have a fridge called the Stinky Fridge or the Stinky Freezer. I know, real scientific. And it has a big, huge note across the top. You do not open this refrigerator unless you do it after hours. Because we want to make sure that we are not going to contaminate everything else we're doing. And we're not going to get our, our lab staff all exposed to this really stinky material unless it's during a certain time. And also what you can do is if you have some very volatile materials, you can set up a weighing station in a walk-in refrigerator or a walk-in freezer so that you can keep these materials cold and that the evaporation will slow down. Now I'm going to give you some sample weighing hacks. Watch your airflow and your temperature. Temperature and airflow are going to directly uh, correlate to some of your error in, in doing your measurements. If you've ever tried to measure something in a hood that has too strong of a flow, it can actually cause the, the, the scale. That's why a lot of scales have those protective airflow covers around them to kind of block that airflow. And the temperature too, if it's really hot in a in an area that you're weighing or really cold and you're weighing liquids, that could affect how much you're weighing and, and how difficult it will be for you to weigh those materials. Combat static. Are you uh, measuring out fine powders and you have static electricity that's making it really hard to, to weigh things? Well, you can actually combat static with a little tool. They usually have these little generators that you can put into a hood and it will dispense static electricity. Or if you want to do it more simply than that, you take a Kim wipe, 
you spray some methanol onto it, you saturate a nice uh, Kim wipe with some methanol, and you put it in the area of the scale, and it will actually start to dampen some of the static electricity. You need a rough filter or a rough funnel. You can use a piece of filter paper as a rough funnel if you need a funnel quickly. Just cut the little hole in the bottom of it after you fold it and you have a little have a little funnel. And not in all cases because it does make a difference, but let's say you, something precipitated out. You were doing an experiment and something precipitated you didn't expect it to, but you really need to save your extract and you don't have some filter paper. Now, this is one of those caveats, it's not for everybody. You can, in a pinch, you can use a coffee filter if you just need to get the solids out of it. Just be aware, you might be introducing some contamination into your process. So if that's going to be a problem, um, keep that in mind. But in a pinch, you can use a coffee filter. Are you missing a scoop or a way boat? If you have plastic pipettes, they make great scoops and great way boats. You just get a scissor, you cut through the bowl of the, of, the, um, of the pipette, and now you have a scoop and now you have a way boat. I use this when I have a sample I'm going to be dipping into over and over again. Uh, I actually just put the, the pipette scoop that I've made in the bag or in the container, so then I could just use that one over and over again. So that's a nice, uh, quick, sample hack that I use all the time. You should also understand what your volumetrics mean. Volumetrics have a huge amount of information on them. They have information about the certification that the manufacturer carries. It gives you the country of manufacturer the, and it will give you the nominal value. So it will say, well, this beaker will hold 15 mils or 50 mils. It will also give you the tolerance. This is the uncertainty for that piece of glassware. In this case, you see it says plus or minus 0.03 mils next to tolerance. That means that the tolerance or the uncertainty for this glassware is 0.03 mils, plus or minus 0.03 mils. Sometimes you'll see the letters TC or TD, and then usually there's a time and a, um, a temperature associated with it. That means to contain or to deliver. So TC is for a piece of glassware that you can contain at that volume, that particular amount of liquid or solvent or whatever else you put in it. And to deliver means once you hit that, that measurement mark, you can pour it into something else. So to contain or to deliver. And then it says at a temperature and sometimes it will also have wait time or EX. That means that delivery time or that contain time is um, expressed in minutes that it takes so many minutes at 20 degrees Celsius to then reach that accurate measuring volume. Then you have precision of your glassware. You have class A. This is your quantitative glassware. This is the highest quality glassware. And this is what you should be using if you are measuring things. If you are just containing things, you know, you just need a beaker and you're approximating the volumes, that can be qualitative, that's class B. But in most analytical laboratories, we depend on class A glassware. And now they have class A equivalent plasticware as well. I've not personally tried it, but I've spoken to people who've used it and they say that it is actually very accurate. Then you have your etchings and gradations. Make sure if you are passing on an experiment from person to person, that they are measuring it the same way. Most of us were taught that the meniscus that's that bottom part of the curve of a liquid has to be touching the line. But sometimes some liquids have what seems to be a double meniscus. Are they measuring at the bottom of the meniscus or are they measuring at the top of the bottom of the of the reflection, so to speak? So make sure that everybody is reading those etchings and graduations at, in the same way. Now I'm going to give you some labware hacks and truths. Did you ever lose a star bar? I usually lose them into the waste container. I've got my stir bar, I'm pouring off my beaker, and whoops, there goes my stir bar into my waste container. There are two good hacks if you don't have a magnetic, uh, they call them magnetic stir bar retrievers. They're just like a long stick with a magnet at the end. There's a couple of things you can do. You can actually get another stir bar and uh, tie a, a piece of string to it or a piece of rope or cord and drop it in, and then you'll get the other, the other stir bar out or you can get a washer. So if you have a washer, then you can 
and make sure it's not an aluminum washer, please. Make sure it's a magnetic uh, washer. You tie a washer to a piece of string or a piece of cord and you dump it in your waste container. You swish it around and you'll be able to pull up your stir bar. Are you writing on your glassware? You're writing your weights on your glassware and you're worried about them smearing. Or when you pour something, you're worried about it's going to get run down the side of your glassware. Well, you should be marking away from the spout. So find the side that's farthest away from the spout and, and mark your, your, um, your important weights there. You can also, if possible, mark your weights on the bottom. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to see. What you also can do is you take a piece of scotch tape and once you've put your marker down, you put the piece of scotch tape over it. Now it's going to be a little harder for that marker to wash off accidentally if you if you pour your solvent. So you can use that as a, as a lab hack. Is your experiment bubbling over? You have a beaker on a hot plate and you're afraid it's bubbling over. You take a glass stir rod and lay it over the top and it will not totally stop it from bubbling over, but it will start to break the bubbles before they, they breach over the side. And if you have a stopper uh, stuck, you have a, a beaker or you have a, a cylinder or something and you have a stopper stuck in it, if you um, heat the top of it, usually under hot running water or something like that, uh, you should be able to get the stopper unstuck from it. And finally, do you have a jar or a lid? Usually uh, samples would come in like in a jar or a container and they have a lid on them. Excuse me. And sometimes they get stuck. You can turn the jar or the bottle over and carefully but firmly wrap it three or four times flat on, on top of a surface or a table and then that jar should open up almost immediately. It's a pretty good uh, hack that I learned very early on in my chemistry career and it works for me. It works for me in, in the chemistry lab and it works for me as home. The only caveat to that one is please do not do that on volumetric glassware. You do not want to, to, to damage your volumetric glassware. So keep it to things that you're, you're not using for measuring. Now let's talk about the chemical components, the standards, solvents, and water. I got some hacks for you for if you use uh, ampules. If you're using an ampule, first of all, you want um, to keep your ampule cool. You don't want it heated, but you also want it to be um, as close to room temperature or the temperature you're going to be using it at the time. So cool, but not hot, because if it overheats a little bit, you're going to build up a little bit of, of of pressure inside that ampule, so you don't want that to happen. So try to keep it um, just a little bit above, uh, below room temperature, so that you're not uh, you're not freeing any gases. You have no evaporation causing any pressure, and you want to snap the ampule away from yourself. You don't want to snap it towards you. I've seen some people grab the ampule and they'll they'll push the top of it away from them, so they're actually snapping it towards themselves. And then there is a, a little trick that I learned when I arrived at Specs. There was a scientist there who showed me how to perfectly pour the contents of an ampule into any vial. So we have a little picture here of a snapped ampule and you can see on the bottom of it, there is a little edge, kind of like a little puzzle piece projection at the bottom of it. And I want that, That's we call this rough edge transfer. What you do is you take your little vial that you'll be pouring it into and before you break it, first of all, uh, flick the top of, of the ampule a few times with your finger. Make sure that any liquid that's in the top of it has now drained. You snap that ampule away from you. And then when you have that rough edge, you take that rough edge and you put it on the opposite edge of the vial that you'll be transferring into. And then you pour. The rough edge up against the opposite edge of the vial creates this little suction that pulls the liquid right into, into the ampule and you will not spill it. Give it a try. It will be life changing that type of hack. If you want to check for leaks, you take a piece of colored paper, a piece of construction paper, you turn your ampule over and you rub it on the surface of the paper. If the paper turns dark, then you know you have a leak in your ampule. You also, um, when are using vials, this is one of my tricks, I share time on the different GC and LCMS systems whenever I do my experiments. And sometimes I need to go back at, as soon as they've run and pull those samples so I can retain them maybe for later use or to check something later. So all of our vials look the same and it makes it really hard for me to quickly pick out which ones are mine. So what I do is I take a Sharpie and I put a slash mark across the top uh, lid or the top vial cap of all of my samples right across the top of all of them. So now when I need to go to that auto sampler tray, I can just pick mine out right away because mine are the ones with the slashes on them.
And again, with the, the Sharpie, if you're writing on those vials and you're afraid they're going to get smeared, uh, once you finish writing it, take a little piece of scotch tape, put it flat around the, the vial, and it will keep your writing intact. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about standards, especially since Spec Certa Prep is a standards company. When you are using standards, you want to bracket them around your target. So you want your target to be within the top and bottom limits. They also have to be within your system's uh, ability to see them. You want them within the level of quantitation and the level of detection. So the level of detection is usually um, three standard deviations from the blank and it's above the noise. A limit of quantitation means you can calculate this. This is the lowest uh, point which you would calculate a sample. And these are usually 10 standard deviations from your blank and above the noise. So level detection is how low can you go and see it and level quantitation is how low can you go and actually quantitate it. Now, Level of linearity or limit of linearity is that space between your level of quantitation and where you start to lose linearity for your system. So when you max out your detector. So that range is where your sweet spot is for your standards. So if your standard, your target is that green dot, you want your standards to be the blue dots and you want them on either side of your target. You also need to know what kind of standards you need to use. Are you going to use an internal standard? These are added to your blanks. They're added to your external standards. They're added to your samples. Uh, these could be used as recoveries or surrogates or spiked uh, samples. And by their very nature, they are matrix matched because you're adding it to everything. You're adding it to all the matrices that you'll be testing. You can use this to correct for instrument variability. Maybe your auto sample is a little older. It has a little bit of wiggle room. Maybe that syringe that, that you're using is starting to develop a little bit of a drift. So it can correct for instrument variability. And you could correct for, uh, like I said, a bad process or a bad syringe or, or things like that. You can also get some information about your extraction efficiencies and you can create response factors using internal standards. And in some cases, you can use them for quantitation if you if you have a response factor for it. The best type of internal standards are labeled analogs. So if you're doing pesticide analysis, a labeled or deuterated pesticide is best for you. Or if you don't have that as a choice, you can use a compound that's similar in nature, but you know for sure is not in your sample. So if you know you're doing um, a, a a, some sort of analysis of food products and you know for sure caffeine is not in your sample, you can then use caffeine then as your internal standard because it's similar in nature to what you're testing, uh, but you know it's not in your sample. And again, you want to have that above the a level of detection and the level of quantitation in the range of your analytes. For external standards, you can use these for uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis, and these duplicate your analysis. So if you're testing for a particular pesticide, you're going to run an external standard of that pesticide. You do not add these to your samples, but you can match them to your matrix. So you might want to match them to the matrix that you're testing, or you could have them in a just a plain solvent. Those are called unmatched. You use these for identification. You uh, use these for semi-quantitative analysis. And again, you want to keep these in the expected range of your quantitation. Let's talk a little now about sorting out your solvents. I have a quick lab hack for you. If you use these squeeze bottles like we do in our laboratory, if you use them as you get them and you fill them up to that nice black line with acetone or methanol, in a very short amount of time, you will notice that your acetone bottle has become a fountain. Because what happens is pressure set, tends to build up in these bottles, even if they're called venting bottles, the pressure tends to, to build up in them and suddenly you have an acetone or a methanol fountain under your hood. Now, this is one of those ones where it does need the caveat. If you do this, make sure you keep these bottles in the hood because you're going to be putting a hole to stop leaking, which sounds counterproductive. So you're going to take uh, some sort of screwdriver or maybe a heated paper clip or something else, and you're going to put the tiniest of holes right on the flat area of that top. It gives just amount, enough of amount of, of ventilation for that bottle and it will stop it from venting. It will stop it from, from, 
becoming a fountain in your laboratory. Now I say this, there's a caveat because your health and safety might have something to say about this. So please check with them and don't say, oh yes, I heard it on a webinar that I could do this, it's perfectly safe. I'm not saying that. I'm saying please check with your health and safety. And if you do it, please keep these bottles under hood because you will be creating a little bit of a hole in the bottle and allowing solvents to evaporate out slightly. Speaking of solvents, we have all been on the different distributor websites and seen a whole mess of solvents. Sometimes a solvent will say like methanol. You can find a dozen different grades of methanol, ACS, anhydrous, environmental, pesticide grade, GC grade, LCMS grade. So are they marketing gimmicks or do they have a reason? The answer is both. There are specific grades of solvent. There is an ACS grade of solvent, and this means it meets ACS, American Chemical Society's specifications for that solvent, and their general use. Something like an HPLC solvent or an LCMS solvent are intended for low UV vis absorbance, low ionic impurities. So they are intended for use for HPLC or LCMS, but each manufacturer has their own idea of what that means. So you have to consult the manufacturer. Purge and trap are meant for use with volatile purge and trap systems. So they usually have low volatile impurities and low boiling points. So there are different uh, criteria for the different types of solvents. So you really should um, understand your process and which one is best for you. You don't want to be using a, a, a general grade or a maybe a biotechnical grade or some other uh, a grade of solvent. If you're doing UV vis and it has a UV uh, visible uh, max for a, a particular wavelength that you're going to be studying. So you really do want to understand how the grades of solvents and the terminology apply to what you need to do. Then there are different solvent classes. In general, and there's some crossover, so this is not an exact science, there is crossover. You have hydrocarbon solvents, things like your aromatics and your aliphatic carbons. These tend to be non-polar solvents. These are your hexanes, your heptanes, your cyclohexane, and things like that. Then you have your polar solvents, which are your oxygenated and your halogenated solvents, your alcohols, your ketones, your ethers, your chlorides, bromides, fluorides, etc. For polar so so excuse me, polar solvents, they can be protic, amphiprotic, or aprotic, that meaning they can donate that proton to whatever um, solvent system or whatever uh, chemical reaction that you're you're working with. Now polar solvents are important because they are polar. They have that ability uh, to to have that uh, polar moment or have that dipole moment. They have the ability to to break apart other chemicals. They tend to have high polarity indexes water being the most polar at 10.2. If you're doing reverse phase chromatography, you know all about polar solvents. They are the solvents you live by. The acetonitrile, the methanol, the ethanol, maybe some THF or some toluene if you use a little bit of toluene too. They all depend on this polarity index. Now what happens when you mix solvents? Well, you can use this formula. This is the formula for the calculating the polarity of a mixture of solvents. And I'm just going to give you a real world example. Suppose you're using 50-50 acetonitrile in water. So for your water, your polarity index is 10.2, and you're using it at 50%, so 0.5. That will give you the polarity of, of 5.1. Then you use acetonitrile at 50%. That's acetonitrile has a polarity of 5.8. Again, it's at 50%, so it's times 0.5, and it gives you 2.9. And then you add them together. So now your overall mixture of 50-50 acetonitrile in water has a polarity of 8. You also have to think about miscibility of solvents. You want to know if I'm going to be um, mixing some toluene in my HPLC system, is it going to give me a problem? Well, if the other component is water, yes, they're not miscible, so you're going to have a problem. You might need something in the center, a bridge solvent, to bring those two together into solution together. You um, also want to understand that your polar solvents are usually going to mix well with your polar solvents, and your nonpolar solvents are usually going to be miscible with your nonpolar solvents. It goes back to that old hack adage, like, likes, like. Are you going to be using additives or buffers or modifiers for your solvents? Well, mostly we use those, especially in LCMS, 
and HPLC to change the pH or to change the pKa and keep our system stable. For HPLCs, you can use buffers such as salts, acetates, and phosphates, but be aware they do create some residue. So um, if you're going to be mixing things like that, you're going to want to filter your, your solvents before you use them as a mobile phase for an HPLC system. LCMF bus buffers need to be more volatile. They're going to help with ionization, and you do not want those salts and residues. So you're going to use things like formates and ammonium compounds instead. And you're also going to want to be aware of what is this uh, particular buffer going to do for my system. If you're using uh, TFA, then it has a pKa of 0.5, and it's going to drop your pH range uh, about 1.5 or less at 0.05%. And you're going to have a UV cutoff of 210. So if you're looking at compounds that have a UV max of 190 to 200, this might interfere with your analysis. If you're going to do something like an acetate, you're going to end up with a pH range that's in the, the four to six range. And you're, again, going to have a UV cutoff of about 210. So you're going to really need to understand the chemistry of your targets and the chemistry of your solvents. Now I'm going to give you some solvent tricks and hacks. If you use acids, maybe you're adjusting a pH or you're doing something and you're adding them dropwise, instead of doing it dropwise of a pure or high concentration acid, you're going to want to make a lower concentration. Maybe you're going to do one mil of acid to 10 mils of whatever you're going to be dissolving into if it's water or acetonitrile or whatever, and use this dilution to um, control your pH. It's, it's a lot easier to control a di dilute solution or a premixed um, mixture of acids and solvents than it is to do dropwise from an acid bottle. And here are some strain uses for some solvents that I've discovered around the lab over the years. You can actually make your own windshield wash. Uh, I worked for a big chemical company and um, I was caught in a winter storm once at the at the chemical company. I went, oh great, I have no windshield wash left. So one of my coworkers pulled out the methanol bottle, pulled out the water, put a few squirts of soap in it, um, a couple of dro uh, drops uh, uh, of an indicator just for coloring, and I had myself a brand new batch of temporary windshield wash. So in a pinch, you can actually make windshield wash. You can also make things like bug killer. If you spray some, some acetone or some, oh, methylene chloride is the best. Uh, if you have a bug in the lab, a little bit of a drop of methylene chloride on a bug and it's dead. I know it's a little gruesome, but it will work. If you have those um, trays, you can see a picture of, of those trays that you get with centrifuge tubes. We actually use those, but sometimes we need to modify the bottom of them or we want to put different types of samples in them. You can dissolve or uh, mold those trays with a little bit of acetone. Take a drop or two of acetone, it liquefies the, the styrene of, of the styrofoam, and you can actually uh, mold those a little bit or dissolve them a little bit. And you can also make your own hand sanitizer and wipes. So if, if you were one of the companies that ran out of wipes, then you can actually uh, make your own wipes with a box of Kim wipes, some ethanol and some water and some other ingredients. And we actually have an infographic about, about what's in um, hand sanitizer that we can offer if you want to see it. Some final thoughts about solvent. Solvents are by their very nature health hazards. They're volatile, they're semi-volatile, they have lower boiling points, they have very high evaporation rates. So if you're doing uh, a lot with solvents, especially if you're running an HPLC or an LC system, an LCMS system, RID or anything like that, uh, you should really be putting a trap on your waste system, something like a vape lock system where you lock those solvent vapors into the hazardous waste container and you don't vent them into the laboratory. Now we're going to talk about the final part, which is the analytical testing. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about HPLC today. And chromatography itself means writing with light. So let's take a little look at the history. Chromatography, in comparison to a lot of sciences we have, is not particularly old. It only started uh, around 1900. That was when the, the first recorded uses were documented for chromatography. And it was the use of separating chlorophyll, the different chlorophyll plant pigments. And it was a very simple separation using a packed a uh, column or a packed tube packed with silica. In the 1940s and 50s, there was a no no Nobel Prize awarded 
for uh, partition chemistry as it pertained to chromatography. So that became the uh, birth of our like thin layer chromatography, our paper chromatography, and then morphed into the chromatography that we began to know in the 60s, the 70s, and really hit laboratories in the 80s and 90s, became commonplace in our laboratories by the 1980s and the 1990s. The very first uh, commercial uh, gas, gas chromatography system was by Hewlett Packard in 1973. So partition chemistry works on the basis of there being a mobile phase and a stationary phase. Obviously, the mobile phase moves, the stationary phase stays put. For most of us, we've done something like a thin layer or a um, paper chromatography. You spot your sample, your mixture on uh, the bottom of your paper, you mark a line, you put it in a bath of mobile phase or you suspend it in a bath of mobile phase and then your spots work their way up over time and then you measure your spots to get your chromatographic separation. That has then made its way to column chromatography. That's where you have the mixture introduced into a column that is that contains your stationary phase, mobile phase is passed through the column, and then your components will separate themselves out and you'll be able to collect them at the end or detect them at the end. So let's look at the language of chromatography. It's based on that partition chemistry, which won the Nobel Prize in 1952. It consists of having multiple phases, a stationary phase, the one that stays put, and the mobile phase, the one that moves. That stationary phase can be a solid or it could be a liquid. A lot of GC uh, stationary phases are actually like a super cool liquid or gel. Um, mobile phase can be a gas like gas chromatography or liquid like liquid chromatography. And that's where we get the basis for the different types of chromatography, the paper, the thin layer, the gas and the liquid chromatography. Let's talk more about liquid chromatography today, though. Now, most systems have very similar components. You have your solvent system, that's your reservoirs, your degassers, your mixing chambers and things like that. Then those move into some sort of pump system. It's either a binary or quaternary pump. The pump is how many channels you can pump at the same time. So a quaternary system, you can pump four channels at the same time, but it also means the pumping power for each of those channels is diminished. So you're going to have uh, less capacity for um, the ability to pump those through your system at a higher rate of speed. A binary system, you have two channels, you only can pump two channels at a time, but it has a little bit more power to the system. For most of us, a binary system is, is perfectly acceptable. I know we have quaternary systems in our lab, the other two containers, kind of our storage. So they very rarely get used. And by the time they do get used, you should be replacing that solvent anyhow. So, you know, even storing it there is kind of a waste. But for most people, a binary system is good enough. There are some specialty applications where you do need a quaternary system. Then you have your injector. If you are uh, old enough to remember some of the, the older HPLC systems, you had a manual injection port. You opened up the port, you put your syringe in, you injected your sample, then you had to close the port, which tended to be the bane of our existence because if you forgot to, to close the port and inject your sample, you were waiting 30 minutes to see nothing. Now they've actually improved that and most of us have auto samplers. So you have your auto sampling tray and you put your samples in it. Then you have your column compartment. At first, they were just compartments that held columns. Then they became heated compartments where you can heat them. Now some of them are heating and cooling compartments where you can cool and heat. I suggest if you have never used the heating cooling compartment on your LC, look into it. Even if you just put it a few degrees above ambient temperature, it will stop all the variation from the room temperature or the laboratory temperature by just having it a couple set a couple of degrees above ambient temperature in your lab. So then you have no more fluctuations between, oh, it's a cold day in the lab. Oh, the air conditioning is too high. Oh, the heating is too high. Oh, the wind is blowing on my LC and now things are changing. If you keep that column compartment closed uh, and you do set it to a few degrees above ambient, even if you're running at room temperature, you will keep that system a little bit more steady. Then you have your detectors, you have your UV, your MS, your RID. Most of them involve some sort of light source, some deuterium lamp or some other type of light source to be used as a detection agent. Then you have your data system. You have your chromatogram and your chromatograph. We kind of use these interchangeably, but 
really the chromatograph is the instrument that records the data and prints it out. And the chromatogram is the actual printout itself. If, again, if you're old enough to remember some of the older systems for a GC or an LC system, you actually had a plotter attached to your computer or a plotter attached to your GC or your LC, and you would get a, um, a plot with little squares on it, your grid paper, your graph paper, and you would sit there with a ruler and you would draw your lines and you would start calculating the area under each of your peaks. And that's how you would calculate your data. Again, life has made things much simpler with computers now, and now the chromatogram and the chromatograph are kind of the same thing. Then you have your auxiliary. These are any of your inline processes, your gases, any waste. Uh, if you have derivatization units, these are all fall into that kind of auxiliary category. So let's talk about LC columns. If you look at an LC column, it usually has a label and it has some information about the column. If it does not have a place for you to um, put an arrow on a date, then make a place for it. One of the things that we almost all do universally is that once we get a column, we open the column up and we write the date on the box. And then we throw the box in a draw. And then we're like, okay, well, again, how long has that column been on the system now? Is it time to change it? So instead, why don't you just write the date with a Sharpie on the column label. Find a little spot, say opened, put the date on it, put your initials on it. And one thing I want you to do if it's already not on the column that, you, that you're using, put an arrow on the direction of flow that you're using it in. Because there's nothing worse than trying to figure out, did I use it in this direction or did I switch it already? Because sometimes we switch our columns, sometimes we back flush our columns. So instead of trying to remember which direction you installed it in, put the little arrow on the column, I installed it in this direction. So now you know, write the date and the arrow on your columns. And we talked a little bit earlier about the different phases, the different solid phases for chromatography. There are two basic ones. There is the, the normal phase liquid chromatography. This is where you have the non-polar mobile phase, your things like your hexanes and your cyclohexanes and things like that, and your polar stationary phase, like your amino stationary phase. These were the first type of chromatography systems that came out. They were normal phase chromatography. Then over the years, we developed reverse phase chromatography, or we call it RP, reverse phase LC. This is a polar mobile phase. You're using acetonitrile, using water and methanol and all those nice polar mobile phases. And you have a nonpolar column like a C8 or C18, which are octadecal columns. When you look at the column anatomy, if you broke open a column and looked at, at the inside, of course, you would first want to know, well, what's the ID? What's the inner dimension uh, of the column? What's the inside measurement of the column? And you'd also want to know a little bit more about the particles. So let's take a closer look at the particles. Silicook particles can be um, round. They can be amorphous. They can be all different shapes and sizes. And, and there's even uh, solid cores now for um, solid phases in a column they call them monolithic columns then you want to know what the particle size and usually the manufacturer almost always puts what the particle size the average particle size maybe it's a five micron particle maybe it's a 10 micron particle maybe it's a 3.5 what they don't usually tell you is how much of the space is void volume or interstitial volume and this contains all the spaces not only between the particles but all the spaces in the pores and the indentations and all the little spaces within the silica particle itself. Generally, most column manufacturers pack about 70% of their columns, so they have about a 70% packing and a 30% void volume. So why do I care about the void volume? Why do I care about these spaces? Well, there's something called dwell time. That's the amount of time when you inject a peak uh, until it will first come out if it's an unresolved uh, peak. And this is basically the start time for your analysis. So your void volume is all of those interstitial spaces, and then that poor volume is the percentage of space filled in your column that I said before is about 70%. If you want to know when does your actual LC analysis begin, you have that dwell time, that's the, the length of time it takes for that peak to go from the injector all the way through the injector and then be the first thing out on your column. And you can calculate how long that's going to take. There is a formula for that. It involves uh, co column diameter, column length, your pore volume, your packing, 
we've made a little chart for you that will give you the average dwell time. This is not exact, despite the decimal points. This is not exact. This has a lot to do, your actual dwell time is going to have a lot to do with how you run your system, how much tubing you have, the diameter of tubing and, and so forth. But these are general rules of thumb. So if you have a very common column, like a 4.6 inner diameter, 50 millimeter column, and you're running at about one mil a minute, it's going to take you 1.2 minutes for that peak to reach the detector. So you're gonna see a peak. So that means that anything you see before 1.2 minutes doesn't really exist. There goes peaks. Let's say you're running even slower. You're running an LCMS system and you're running at half a mil a minute and you're running a little smaller column, maybe a 2.1 by um, 100. That's almost two and a half minutes before that first peak comes out. So you want to be aware that any peaks you see before two and a half minutes aren't actually real. They are in your uh, void volume or your dwell time. Okay, let's say you don't want to do this for your system. You're like, I don't know all these variables. I have no idea how to do this calculation. I don't want to deal with it. Well, you can use the clock instead. You find a compound that is going to be unretained on your system, something that you know that for your particular method is going to be the very first thing that, that comes out. Maybe it's caffeine. Maybe it's something like a check standard or something like that. You know that as soon as it, it, it hits the detector, it's going to come out. It's going to be the very first thing. Use the timer on your, on your system. And if you know that that peak takes 1.3 minutes to come out, well, there's your dwell time. It's 1.3 minutes that you're not actually going to see anything for 1.3 minutes. Let's talk about methods now. In general, there are two types of methods. There's an isocratic me method. This is where you keep the same constituents, the same solvents and mobile phases throughout your method. You let the column chemistry basically do all the work. This is necessary in maybe an RID where you cannot change the um, percentages of your solvent over time because you have that reference cell that you really need to keep it to. So in that case, you're going to um, basically calculate your mixture and keep that isocratic method throughout. Then there's the gradient methods. This is where you have your dwell time. That's the very first part of the time. Then you're going to have the gradient. Maybe you're changing from 80-20 water acetonitrile, which has a, a polarity value of 9.3, and you're going to change it over a course of time to 50-50. And then you're going to go to 100% acetonitrile during your flush. At the end of it, you're going to want to build in a requilibration time. This is the amount of time it takes to get back to that normal uh, that initial set of conditions. Just remember, if your dwell time is two minutes, your reequilibration time should be two minutes too. It's going to take the same amount of time to go through the system again. So make sure you build in the appropriate reequilibration time. Let's now take a look at the stationary phases. If we look at that silica particle and how it goes in the column, you have all these open uh, silica, you have all these open silanols and free silica on your on your uh, column and on your silica particle. What column manufacturers do is then they will coat those free silica and those silica uh, silanols, excuse me, with stationary phase, whatever it be, C8, C18, or whatever. Unfortunately, they don't hit all the spots. So there are going to be some open spots and they sometimes will do something called end capping. They'll introduce another chemical, which will then bind to those open spots, those open silanols or those open free silica spots, and they will bind them. This is good for uh, several reasons. First, it does not allow for any band broadening with your compounds because you don't have your compounds interacting in spaces in your column you don't intend them to. Do. You also don't have the attack of the solvents or acid or anything else that you're running through your system on those free silanols or the, those free silica. So these end caps kind of protect and make your column a little bit more robust. Which column should I use? It depends upon what you're studying. What's your target? Is your sample solvent in, sol soluble in water and polar solvents, then you're going to be doing reverse phase or ionic phase. And depending on what type of sample is it, is it ionic, is it neutral, is it mixed, is it acetic or basic, you have different choices of columns. Anything from um, an ion exchange column, like a cation or an anion exchange column, all the way through the different C8, C18, C30s. Now, if your samples are nonpolar or normal phase, then you're going to be using things like a cyano column, amino column, the column of polar, and you're going to be using nonpolar mobile phases. Now it's time for a few instrument hacks. Picture your process. 
And by that, I mean get your phone out. If you're doing any maintenance to your system and you're taking it apart, take pictures. You have a phone with, with photo capabilities. Almost everybody does nowadays. Take pictures as you go through taking off the different connectors. Make sure that you take the pictures because then when you forget how to put them back together, you can flip backwards through your pictures and you can put your whole system back together that way. Um, it's a simple tool. We use it all the time for stupid things. Use it for something important. And again, I know it's it's kind of obvious. Choose maintenance over repair. Oh, I'll get to it. I'll drain the system and clean it when, you know, when I get some downtime. Well, if your system breaks down, now you have downtime. Instead, take the downtime and clean your system and do your maintenance properly. Finally, know your address. Here's another one of those caveats. Um, often you'll talk to an instrument manufacturer and they now have the ability to sometimes remote into your system or sometimes you need to connect a printer or you need to, to connect the different modules together because something got disconnected and you are going now crazy trying to find the IP address of the different modules of your system. Get a Sharpie out and write the address, the IP address of your modules somewhere that you're going to be able to find it. Now, the caveat that being is that, yes, it's an IP address and you don't want the world to know it. So put it in a place that's not totally obvious uh, and your IT department might have something to say about that. But I know that I would rather look on the side of my LC and say, oh yeah, the auto sampler address is da 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 da. And now I don't have to try to figure out, well, how do I find the IP address to give to the service engineer? Let's talk a little bit about um, the different detectors. Of course, you have all sorts of detectors, RID, fluorescence, um, you have um, light scattering, nitrogen detectors, but we really use the most in, in our laboratory, our UV-Vis and our MS. And then in particular, I'm gonna talk a little bit about UV-Vis. And this is encompassing the spectrum of, of light, which is visible or ultraviolet. So that's the UV and the Vis, between 10 nanometers and about seven or 800 nanometers. Now, why this matters is if your particular compound has a specific functional group, maybe you're studying aldehydes. Well, you're going to want to know the max absorption for the aldehyde functional group is 210. So that's one of those wavelengths you're going to want to monitor. Or maybe it has a naphthalene ring, or maybe it's got a benzene ring. You're going to be wanting to monitor 254, 255. So those are going to help you to, to really decide on which wavelengths you're going to monitor for your analysis. You're also going to want to know what the UV cutoff is for the solvent. If I'm looking at an aldehyde, but I'm using a system which has uh, maybe some THF in it, I'm going to get some background noise because THF has a UV cutoff of 210 and my aldehyde is also 210. So maybe that's not always the best choice for me. Or I might have to monitor what the background is going to be for, for that particular system or method. Let's say you don't know what wavelength you're going to start with. You have a sample, maybe you got an extract. It's kind of got like this pretty kind of orangish color. Well, if you know what color it is, you can kind of backtrack and figure out what wavelength range you want to be in. So if you are seeing an orange color, that means that green and blue are being absorbed and you're in the wavelength about 480 to 490. So you can, Quick rule of thumb, if your sample has a particular color, you can backtrack and kind of figure out where in the wavelengths you're going to want to be to be monitoring. And you can always use an internal standard. We talked about internal standards before. You can always use an internal standard that has a specific um, color or UV vis. This one happens to be a standard, internal standard that we have for a dye molecule that uh, is um, maxes at 570. And then you can create yourself a uh, concentration or you can create yourself a, a trend line that you can then use to create a response factor to calculate the ratio of your sample. This is great for different types of experiments like a kinetic experiment. Some final thoughts and hacks and then we have a few minutes for questions. Your desk will do it all. If you think about your, your paper clips and your binder clips, I use them as septum removers. I clip lines together. I use them to hold the columns in place. I'll take a big binder clip and clip my column into the column compartment. I'll use an unwound paper clip to clear a clog if I have a, a clog in something. So I use um, a lot of things like my, my paper and binder clips for everything. Tape, tape is golden. Tape you can use for almost anything. You can secure marker ink, make something spill proof, mark tubing. So tape is very important. It's kind of uh, like 
liking duct tape for everything in your house. Pen and Sharpies. If your ballpoint pens are not going to work, you can actually uh, throw them in a plastic bag, throw that plastic bag in your in your hot bath, your water bath, and heat them up, and that will help the ink start to flow again. If you have markers, let's say you're using a Sharpie and somehow the tip got wet, well, that Sharpie suddenly doesn't write again. But if you actually take a little bit of acetone and dip the tip of your Sharpie into acetone and wait a minute or two, it will dry out the water from, from the Sharpie and you'll be able to, to write on it again. And if your Sharpie starting to go a little dry, take a little bit of acetone, take one of your little syringes, inject a little tiny bit of acetone into the tip, it will wake it up and you'll be able to use it again. And if you don't have any acetone to clean Sharpie off of a surface, if you take that Sharpie and you write again over that Sharpie and immediately wipe it, the Sharpie actually takes the Sharpie off. So those are a few little last minute hacks that we can help give you because the desk will do it all. And finally, paper. Again, you can use it for weighing, for funnels, for scoops. You can use that construction paper for a leak check. And hopefully we've given you some insight into the analytical laboratory and give you a bunch of lab hacks you can try for yourself. And I'm going to turn it back over to Diane and we have a couple of minutes for questions. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. This is Diane here. Sorry, I had an echo there for a second. Um, thanks, Patricia. That was uh, tons of great information. Um, so wanted to let everyone know um, we've got a couple minutes here for questions. Uh, if you've got some uh, that you want to put in the chat box here, um, I've got a, a couple that were sent ahead of time. So we'll go ahead and start with those. Um, so the first one that I have here is, uh, should my lab pre-filter my mobile phases prior to use or are there filters in the system enough? Well, it depends on, on what you're doing with your mobile phases. If you're taking a mobile phase from a uh, supplier, like an HPLC grade methadone, and you're just pouring it into your reservoir, that filtration that the manufacturer does is enough. But if you're adding a buffer, especially salts, maybe you're dissolving some salts into that buffer, then you really should filter that because you're adding something to that before you put it on your system. So uh, in the cases of pure buffers, or um, excuse me, pour, pure solvents, you can use as is. If you're mixing buffers into them, especially salts or solids, definitely, definitely then filter your mobile phases. Great. Um, and then a question here from Henry uh, says, halfway through your presentation, you mentioned that uh, more information with regards to making one's own hand sanitizer is something we can access. Where do we go to find this information? Um, we'll give that information to uh, to Diane and she can send it out to you all. Um, I, I'm not sure. We actually might have an infographic on our social media, but we will definitely get the, the link to Diane and she can pass it along to everybody else. Otherwise, feel free to look on our specs website. We have all of our knowledge base there, including infographics and and uh, all sorts of other white papers and things like that. Great. And then Drew's got a question here. Can HPLC be used to measure ethanol and what column should I use? Yes, HPLC can be used to measure ethanol. You need a um, something like an ion exchange car a column. Um, we use in particular, we use a, a, a phenomenon X column. Um, it's a, I'm trying to remember, it's a hydrogen ion exchange column um, but yes you can use it's, it's mostly it's called size exclusion um, chromatography sec and you can use that for um, measuring ethanol if you want more details if you pass your your email and your question on to diane and she can forward it to us and i can get you the exact specifications of what we use to do ethanol analysis in our laboratory great and then I've got a question from Sam, says he, uh, not a chemist, but can you tell me whether conjoined double peaks still cause problems with identifying detri I'm gonna butcher this, detriment hands, <laughs> uh, benzo versus fluorinthine? Uh, I would have to see that in writing because I'm not quite in sure what, what you're pronouncing. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. We can, I can follow up with Sam on that after this. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then just, just a general comment here. I know some folks um, had to hop off because uh, we are at the hour, but uh, the presentation will be made available and we'll send that out to everyone in a follow-up email. Um, and you can definitely use that um, for training on uh, folks that were not able to attend today. Um, and then a question here from Haley, what is the best way to get rid of ghost peaks on an HPLC? 
It depends on what's causing your ghost peaks. Ghost peaks can be caused for uh, a bunch of different reasons. The most common uh, one is there is some sort of a refractive index change when the um, when the injector injects the sample. So sometimes you can get like negative ghost peaks um, by sol If you do solvent and matrix matching, that means you know. Let's say your um, your matrix is going to be 50-50 acetonitrile in water, but your solvent that your sample's in is in methanol, then you're actually increasing the um, the, the differences that are going to create ghost peaks. So um, doing some matrix matching, some solvent matching of your samples to your mobile phase will help you a lot. One of the best things I do is I actually... Um, uh, aliquot, once I make up mobile phase for my system, I aliquot uh, 50 or 100. So let's say you're making a liter. I make a liter and a half. And I pour that liter into my system, and that half liter goes into a bottle, and that is then the solvent I use to make up the samples while I'm using that that solvent, because I know it's going to be perfectly matched to what I'm what I'm using in my LC system. That will help with your, with your ghost peaks a lot. Great. And then a follow up here from Drew. It says also can uh, CU2 ions be measured with an HPLC? Not well. Um, mostly if you're going to be doing metal ions, um, depending on when they what they complex with. If you're looking for just the ions themselves, you're going to be looking you, you you're better off using an IC or an ICP or ICPMS. If you're using uh, looking for a complex um, like, for example, we can look at organic arsenic species on our LCMS and we can see them. We can see organotin compounds on our HPLC system. But if you're looking for copper ions, you're better off with an, an ICP, an ICPMS, or an IC system. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our rapid fire questions here. <laughs> Thanks for answering those, Patricia. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks to everyone who's still on board here. Um, like I mentioned, we'll we'll send up a follow up with the recording um, as well as uh, all the information here today from the slides and uh, reference charts and tables. So again, and I hope everyone has a wonderful week.